got the fourth floor. What's the fourth floor? Fourth floor. Okay. Take it down. Sarge, there should be 24 left. In the toughest jails in America, black prisoners are listening to a new voice of authority. Praise be to Allah, Lord of the worlds, the beneficent, the merciful, owner of the... Thousands of hardened criminals are turning to Allah. We seek for help. Show us the straight path. All over the country, black Americans are converting to Islam, now the fastest growing religion in the United States. There's only one truth. There's no God but, but Allah. If a man is not serving Allah, he's serving shaitan. There's no other way but Islam, period. And all the knowledge in the world comes from this book. Louis Farrakhan is the man most think of as the leader of black Muslims in America. But Farrakhan is not a true Muslim. He leads a sect called the Nation of Islam and preaches that Allah is preparing to destroy the United States. I intend by the power of Almighty God to turn America upside down and around. Hi, my brother. Can I give you one of these? Give you one of these today? But while Farrakhan is a symbol of protest, Orthodox Muslims dismiss him as a fraud. In the streets of America's cities, men like Rausan Tamir are spreading the word of the Quran. It's the invitation to learn something about the religion of Al Islam from our holy book, the Quran, not the perspective that you might be getting from Minister Farrakhan. They always want to give you Minister Farrakhan. Well, that's not how the religion of Al Islam goes. It's a phenomenon that has gone largely unnoticed and unreported. Islam could become the most important black movement in America since Martin Luther King fought for civil rights in the 60s. If the masses of the African American public was to take on this religion, the revolution would have been fought and won. It's for all human beings, because when you think about all human beings... Allahu Allah! In ghettos which the civil rights movement passed by, a homegrown Islam is gaining converts. Islam is a new call to arms in the war against drugs, alcohol and crime. Islam is a certain way of life that it provides you with a, a blueprint for living. Ahmed Abdurrahman was a member of the militant Black Panther Party in 1971 when he was convicted of murder. He served 21 years in jail. If uh, a large percentage of our community just did the simple thing of not using any drugs and any intoxicants, any alcohol, it would in itself bring about a change in their lives. And in many African Americans who become Muslims, just that rule in itself changes their lives positively. In the inner cities, more black men go to jail than to college. Where two out of three children grow up without fathers, street gangs are the only family for many young blacks. How you doing, brother? You all right? Yes, sir. Ahmed was still on parole when he took us into the ghettos of Detroit. He too was once a member of a drug gang. Very much the way animals mock their turf, you know, gangs put signs out to tell other gangs that this is their area, to establish that this is their, their turf. Through the glamorization of it by gangster rap, it's spreading throughout the country where young people see gangs as being 
uh, these kind of gangs as being one of the main ways to be hip or cool. Gang turf is not just based upon pride that you're a member of another gang, you don't come in my neighborhood. It's based upon money. We alone sell drugs in this neighborhood, and if you sell drugs in our neighborhood, we'll kill you. So quite a few of the killings that take place and the crimes uh, center around the drug traffic and, uh, and the fighting among gangs for the control of the drug traffic. In some jails, one in three black inmates has converted to Islam. Ahmed became a Muslim after five years in jail. I could not deal with the stress that I was under by myself. Islam provides a system of brotherhood of others who are striving with you to bear what you're facing and to develop as human beings even though they're in, in an inhumane situation. How many of you have, have been here more than once? How many of you have been here more than five times? <clears throat> five million people in the United States are under the supervision of the criminal justice system. If it continues to increase, this number will soon rival the six million enrolled in the nation's higher education system. Frightening. Across the country, some of these men will return to the gangs after their release, but they all take Islam with them. It seems to offer hope of rebuilding the social and family ruins in the ghettos. I look in your faces, man, and it, and it saddens me. Because every time I look at you, I see a father and his child. How many of you have children? If you're in here, who's guiding your babies? You have become Satan's the shaitan's instrument to take your children and fill up the prisons with. Young prisoners claim Islam will change their lives. A lot of the youngsters in my age, we are not a, we're not really addicted to drugs, we're addicted to the street life and the way of life, chasing a dream, chasing a false dream that we have been brought up and sold, the drug dealers, the big car, the fancy cars, you know, the pimps and the players and the hustlers, we have all chased them dreams, you know, and like myself, I'm not chasing that dream no more, I'm dealing with reality today, I cannot be a pimp, player, hustler, none of that, I'm just a man, you know. In a district of Chicago known as Terror Town, the Imam or priest Rami Mohammed leads Friday prayers. Rami spent five years as a U.S. Marine. He taught himself Arabic and converted to Islam while working as a prison guard. If thou hast willed our defeat, thou will be worshipped no more. Amin was once charged with a double murder. He's one of several former gang members who attend the mosque. Allah subhanahu will suffice you. Every day Amin joins Rami on patrol. Their mission, to drive out the shops that sell alcohol and the gangs that sell drugs. No much, man. I ain't seen you in a while, man. Mike is a gang member who was paralyzed when gunned down by a rival. Rami suspects he still deals in drugs and is trying to persuade him to become a Muslim. You say yourself, you'd be willing to come wholeheartedly and with, even with anyone that you know to something that's positive. And we're saying how this would actually aid the cause of Islam and we could actually really raise up a strong Islamic nation. If we had more jobs up in here, then, you know what I'm saying, there wouldn't be no reason to sell drugs. Like her, she just graduating from uh, high school. She, she ain't going to get no good job, you know what I'm saying? Then she going to, you know what I'm saying, probably look at the streets again. Many of the stores selling alcohol in these ghettos are owned by Arab immigrants, most of whom are Muslim. They are one of Rami's key targets. You see here, one of the uh, major problems in America, stopping the Islamic movement is many of the Arabs 
who come from many parts of the world are coming to America, abandoning, abandoning Islam, and are selling pork, alcohol, fornicating with women, and it, wherever you find a liquor store, you'll find a major drug area. They feel that they are beyond the law, but soon they will see. Rami believes in direct action. Assalamu alaikum man, itta huda. Yaqi, why do you still sell the wine, the pork, when you know Allah forbids it? What's your excuse? Why do you all constantly come to the black community and exploit us? Sell the people this poison, take the blood, the heart, and the soul from them. Your services will be terminated one day, and you have to deal with Allah and Qiyamah. Every black person you sell your poison to is a potential Muslim, someone to uplift and, and raise up the people. Everyone that you sell your, your pork to is a potential Muslim. 3,500 Arab-owned liquor stores in the black community. You take the money out of our community and you take it. It is a drug. It is legal. It is, it is a drug. You move, you move your liquor store to jail. Say, but what about the Arabs? Go talk to you don't people. see. With our people, you have to speak the language in which they can understand. You see any the language of a 38 is a 45. You have to be real. You have to be so real and so raw that the meat will fall off the bone. You talking about? So that makes it all right for you to disobey a law and to come in the black community and sell this poison. You're not feeding it to your own mother, your brothers, your sisters, or any Arabs. You come in my community, the black community. These are my people. These are my people. The blood in their veins is mine. You worse than swine. You worse than pigs. You got lottery here. Pork here. Your, your product's not good. You follow people around. Fornicating with the women. With our women. Sucking every blood, every remnant of life out of my community. You're not going to be allowed to continue it. The law of Islam is over America. It is over any government. La ilaha illallah wahduhu la sharika lahu. What? Tabia shuf? But the anta tabia kanzil wa khamar? Yeah. And you say Allah? Yeah. You think it's a game? Yeah, it's a game. It's a game to you yeah. to exploit black people. It's a game to you to sell them pork and wine and to say you're Muslim, to rely on the relationship of Islam to protect your butt. You cannot pay the, the gangs out here enough money to protect your store. Muslim immigrants in America are often traders who've settled in their own well-to-do suburbs. Rami's anger over the sale of alcohol is fueled by a wider resentment that immigrants are exploiting urban blacks who own few businesses themselves. We'll close you up. Your mouth, your heart, your lungs. It's coming. It is coming. The dean of Islam going to raise his head. And it's going it's to raise, yeah, see what he says, show it to his mother, back in Philistine or wherever he at. Come to my community, selling my people this. You all be shame of yourself. But you have no shame, for you don't feel law. And the law is going to deal with you in this life and in hereafter. And his servants going to deal with you in this life. You can count on it. The Ummah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam going to raise his head. And going to hit the snake wherever he see it. Get ready for it. You can see me right now. <laughs> the liquor stores and the drug dealers are on the east side of Chicago's Yates and 75th Street. On the other side, Rami and Amin have laid down the law of Allah. Drugs aren't sold here, and there are no shops selling alcohol. But the victims of his tirade are cynical. I wouldn't doubt if he drink or not. Maybe it's a, there's a bottle behind his bed. Oh no, believe me. To establish peace down here, if some of our brothers have to be killed, if some of our brothers have to be imprisoned, we are prepared to pay that price for the overall good. We would go to war and we would not fear no consequences. We would only fear Allah, only. Allah says, Don't fear the mankind, but fear me. Shortly after we filmed, Amin was convicted of illegally possessing a gun and sentenced to four years in jail.
Christianity remains the dominant faith in the African-American community, despite the growth of Islam. At the Word of Faith Church in Detroit, Pastor Keith Butler treats Islam as a sideshow. Amen. We have the BBC with us today. It's, as it turns out, British Broadcasting Company, BBC, is with us, shooting some of our services today. Uh, amen. They think that Islam is growing. I'm, how many of us know it ain't growing? <laughs> it ain't growing. It ain't going nowhere. Jesus is Lord. Glory. This nation here in America was built upon the Bible. The basis of all jurisprudence in this country is the scripture. Uh, and in fact, the basis of all Western society is in fact that. Uh, uh, without the uh, Christian faith, if, uh, the Western world will look like most of the third world, which is terrible. During the civil rights movement, the rhetoric of black political protest resounded from churches. In the 30 years since the death of Martin Luther King, many churches have become less radical. Butler's message, broadcast to homes throughout the United States, is that blacks can now succeed in mainstream America. Thank you, Father, that the needs of this assembly is met in an abundance beside, and the needs of those sowing seed today are met and an abundance beside. His congregation is mostly middle class, drawn from those African Americans able to share the American dream. Praise God. Ushers can receive the offering. Praise the Lord. There are some people never receiving anything from God at all. For they are shaken in their believing. When they don't see results, they quickly fall. Butler has moved his church from downtown Detroit to the more prosperous suburbs facing criticism that he has abandoned the inner city. Who said all blacks had to be poor? And that if, if blacks are middle class, that blacks don't, don't reach out to their underclass brother? Who said that blacks can only be in certain places? That's racism. Uh, there are blacks in this area and blacks all over this area, and they come from every area. He moved out of the city of Detroit, and he's symbolically through his actions showing that even the church itself is not looking to help this community. We are taking our people out of the community, not trying to deal with the problems of the community, but taking our people away from those problems. And uh, that's something that we haven't seen that any masjid, any mosque, any Muslims would do. Their problem is the only people they can reach are the ones who are in trouble. We're able to reach out to people who are in trouble and people who are not in trouble. And that's what it's really all about. Uh, and so they're trying to make hay where there are problems. That's because they can't go anywhere else. They don't have much of a message. Hanif Abdul Rahman believes Islam does have a message. He carries it to downtown Detroit. He thinks that black Americans who worship in a Christian church are accepting the religion and attitudes of the slave owners. Slavery is an attempt to dehumanize a people and to make them feel that they can never come out from under that dehumanizing process. When we were brought here as slaves, the God that they gave us, Jesus, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, oh Jesus. Hanif also objects that Jesus is usually shown as white, like the slave masters of old. It is a religion that has influences in it that promote white superiority. So if an African American accepts Christianity as it is now, they're accepting black inferiority. So it can't work. It can't work. Hanif attends the Muslim Center, formerly an abandoned bank. 
There are more and more new mosques in Detroit, social centers, as well as places of worship. Islam historically has been accepted by the dispossessed very readily. Hanif used to be called Smith, the name given to his slave ancestors by their owners. He changed his name, believing that would free him from the legacy of slavery. What's your name? My name is James Smith. James Smith? Yeah, African-American named James Smith. It's an English name. It didn't take a rocket scientist to see that this African-American is not an Englishman. He's not a European. He's not a Caucasian. It's James Smith? Islam in America first flourished thanks to a man who changed his name, from Robert Poole to Elijah Muhammad. He was a poor laborer who left the cotton fields of Georgia for Detroit. In the 1930s, Detroit and other northern cities were the promised land for poor southern blacks seeking jobs and new lives. It was here that Elijah Muhammad believed he met Allah in the form of a man. Just one likeness of this Arab man remains. He apparently went by the name of Master Farad Muhammad and he persuaded Elijah to create a new religion in which black men were God's divine people. Elijah wrote his own holy text, the message to the black man in America, using references from the Quran, but also from the Bible. He wrote that Allah himself had told him that over 6,000 years ago, the white race was created by a crazy black chemist. Caucasians, especially those with pale skin and blue eyes, were the devil itself. He preached that blacks should have pride in their race. He forbade alcohol and drugs and urged fathers to support their families. White America is doomed, he wrote, soon to be destroyed by a huge spaceship, the mother of planes, which carries flying saucers and will drop bombs that fall one mile into the earth before exploding. His creed was a hodgepodge of folklore and superstition, but he built up what would become the nation of Islam using the language and rhetoric of the Muslim faith. It's always a blessing to be in the presence of a man of God. It's a blessing to be in the presence of a servant of God. By the early 60s, the movement's spokesman and most charismatic orator was Malcolm X. Like others, he had changed his family name to X in order to show that black Americans did not know their original African names. This great messenger whom you are about to hear has a message from God which consists of a solution from God that will solve the problem of the white man as well as the problem of the black man. This was complete heresy to orthodox Muslims around the world. For them, the only true prophet was Muhammad, not a man once called Robert Poole. Hey, salam alaikum. In 1964, the nation of Islam was shaken to its core. Malcolm X suddenly converted to Orthodox Islam. During a pilgrimage to Mecca, he decided that the teachings of Elijah Muhammad were absurd. Malcolm X had now linked himself and other blacks who followed him to millions of Muslims around the world. Elijah Muhammad was furious. Since I went to Mecca, and uh, reported that uh, the religion of Islam is a religion of brotherhood which includes all mankind. It caused a great deal of wrath in the heart and mind of Elijah Muhammad who has been teaching that uh, the white race is a race of devils. When I wrote a letter back from Mecca uh, while I was doing my religious pilgrimage pointing out that at Mecca I found every specimen of humanity from the whitest white to the blackest black and why it, uh, it upset Mr. Muhammad because it more or less pulled the rug right out from the heart of his teaching. So uh, they have begun to plot and scheme and plan, but up to now, thanks to Allah, they haven't been successful. 
One of Elijah Muhammad's most zealous backers was a young protege named Louis Farrakhan. In the movement's newspaper, he launched a vitriolic attack on Malcolm X, calling him a hypocritical dog. A few months later, Malcolm X was assassinated. Two members of the Nation of Islam were convicted of his murder. The killing had surprisingly little impact on the movement, which Elijah Muhammad still ran with an iron grip. Only a small group supported Malcolm X. The Nation of Islam branded him a traitor and continued to strengthen. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad. Louis Farrakhan replaced Malcolm X as Elijah Muhammad's closest advisor. The Nation of Islam was growing as the Black Power Movement challenged traditional civil rights groups. One of its most famous converts was the boxing champion, Muhammad Ali. The nation remained secretive and militaristic. Elijah Muhammad demanded that blacks be given land to form their own nation, separate from the United States. They boast about what they have and what they will deprive us of. I say the earth belongs to the black man. Elijah was highly superstitious. He thought seven was a lucky number, so he chose his seventh son, Wallace D. Muhammad, to succeed him as leader. This would have an astonishing effect on Islam in America. Despite years of indoctrination, W.D. Muhammad came to believe that his father was wrong and Malcolm X was right. In 1975, Elijah Muhammad died and his son W.D. sparked a revolution. He denounced his father's beliefs and began to break up his movement. With the passing of the leader, we saw a need to uh, go to the holy book of all the Muslims and base ourselves right there and root ourselves right in the Quran. He told his father's followers that their religion had been based on folklore and mythology. I can't say we were really believing in Islam but we were innocent and we thought we were believing in Islam. Elijah Muhammad gave us a myth, a myth that boosted the ego and, and made us feel good about ourselves. I don't see white people as a devil, I see any bad person as a devil. I was successful, thank God, in getting most of the followers of my father to see the Quran as the direction for us. I'm still very much in line with my father's social reform message, though I've uh, put down his religion. <laughs> I, uh, I, fall, I... After W.D. Muhammad dropped talk of destroying America and forming a separate black nation, the mainstream media ignored his movement. But it has been marching on. Over the last six years, the number of mosques has doubled. Orthodox Islam now has two million African-American followers. We're here today getting our physical food. We have to eat. While most whites associate Islam with terrorist bomb plots, W.D. Muhammad's followers have been providing social services to the ghettos. They say they are restoring self-respect to the downtrodden. Theologically, this is orthodox Islam. In Detroit's Muslim center, the daily rituals are being taught just as they are anywhere in Islam wash before praying to keep out the devil in a dirty world. And you, you start here in this uh, fold here at the top and you go on down through the fold and you end up right in the center. 
and we do both of them at the same time because while the devil, you know, while you're washing one ear, he can sneak up and whisper in this ear. <laughs> See? So you do them both at the same time. This is Islamic fashion. It's a far cry from the days of Elijah Muhammad. The people who follow his son say they are strengthened by Islam, but they don't want to be at war with white America. The show's organizer is Amira Wazir. Make him fall in love all over again. You're the woman that turns him on. W.D. Muhammad's mission is to adapt Islam to the character of America. The movement tries to appeal to the modern American woman, even while retaining traditional Islamic dress, which covers the hair and body. Islamic modesty demanded that for this event, our camera crew had to be female. Everybody that's in that room is female. And at that point in time, they get an opportunity to party with us, you know, and this is exactly what we do. You know, America knows that behind closed doors now, uh, we partay. <laughs> You are a people with these particular traditions. We grew up dancing, we grew up with music. Then you do bring that to the religion. Just as I bring my height with me, I'm not going to change it. I bring my height to the religion. Amira believes that Islam provides black women more dignity than they are usually given by white society. But that doesn't mean that they must reject everything American. I wouldn't like to see us sound like uh, Turkish people or sound like um, uh, Pakistani people with our culture, with our music, etc. Uh, that, that, that's phony. That's imitative. That's uh, copying somebody. You are not yourself. And that won't help us at all. I would like to see us right where we are, take the best of what we have, and just uh, express it as Muslims and it will come out beautifully, and it will be our identity and our culture. Oh, what a beautiful day. This blending of Islam and African-American culture has proved popular with most of the original members of the Nation of Islam. Mohammed Sadiq is marrying off two of his 15 children. He now believes that Islam can enable blacks to gain their rightful place in America. But back in the 60s, he was a keen follower of Elijah Muhammad and the bow-tied extremism of the Nation of Islam. After Elijah's death, Sadiq, like his friend Muhammad Ali, followed W.D. Muhammad into Orthodox Islam. Sadiq became an imam in a middle-class suburb in Indiana. Sadiq no longer preaches about white devils, but about the degeneracy of America's sexual revolution. I'm looking at all kinds of little strange ideas creeping into our thinking today. Strange relationships between men and women. Strange relations between men and men. Strange relationships between women and women. Strange attitudes toward... But one of Sadiq's old colleagues followed a very different path, Louis Farrakhan. Sadiq remembers how Farrakhan became disillusioned when W.D. Muhammad embraced Orthodox Islam. Farrakhan missed the limelight and hated the criticism of Elijah Muhammad. It was very difficult for many people to come to grips with the fact that many of the things that we had learned were not accurate. 
uh, coming to grips with. It was difficult for Minister Farrakhan coming to grips with, with uh, having been deceived in many uh, instances. And uh, uh, I heard Minister Farrakhan himself said he had been deceived. Eventually, he returned to preaching that Elijah Muhammad was the divine messenger. After about three years of my leadership, uh, Farrakhan, uh, Minister Farrakhan, uh, he came to me and he told me that uh, he has been trying to go along, but it's become more difficult uh, for him to go along with, with things that I was saying about the Honorable Elijah, about my father, he said, um, to discredit him. Farrakhan disagreed with the turn that I made to the real Islam, and he decided to go back and revive the nation of Islam. I said Hitler was a wickedly great man. I didn't make a mistake. I know the language. You taught it to me, white folks. Now all of a sudden you got dumb to the meaning of what great is. By deliberate provocation and calculated showmanship, Louis Farrakhan created a new following. To the anger of his old colleagues, he presented himself as a Muslim, even though what he taught had little to do with orthodox Islam. Will you do that, America? Will you stop us? The strategy now is offensive in the sight of God. That's unacceptable. That's wrong. And I think that strategy has to find its ending if Minister Farrakhan is going to save himself. And if you do, what should our response be? What did you say? You should be pushing the Quran. So if you're not pushing the Quran, then what are you pushing? Your own agenda. And using God's holy name to shield your... To hold his own brand of al-Islam. That's one of the biggest wrongs that you can do in our religion. Cleverly exploiting the power of television, Farrakhan became a public figure. Disillusioned blacks were impressed and he reinforced white America's suspicion of anything to do with Islam. I will be more successful than all those that went before me because the time is right, the season is right, you are right, the conditions are right. We must go free now. Now is the time. And so when I say I'm introducing our leader, I mean it from the bottom of my soul. I'm saying this as a Christian minister. Ten years on, Farrakhan gets a wider hearing. He now tries to appeal to black Christians. Our leader, our champion, our messenger, our prophet, alive in this hour, God's man, for God's people, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Those words of praise are from a Christian minister. Louis Farrakhan wants to become the spokesman of all blacks, Muslim, Christian, godless. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. But he is still devoted to the cult of Elijah Muhammad. He praises Farad, who told Elijah he was Allah, God himself, back in the 30s. I am eternally grateful to Allah for intervening in our affairs in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, the great Mahdi, who came among us and raised among us the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I greet all of you with the greeting words of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Farrakhan claims he is a Muslim, but like Elijah, he quotes more from the Bible than the Quran. Our Father, which art in heaven. In public, he has dropped his most menacing, intolerant language. He urges black people to take control of their own lives. I am tired of living in a country where other people determine my future. For much of America, he remains a threatening figure. His security guards still wear the bow ties and smart suits designed by Elijah Muhammad. The movement is still obsessed with secrecy and conspiracy. But his political aim is to lead black protest. 
The rich like things exactly as they are so that the rich can continue to get richer on the backs of the poor. No, no, no. This was Farrakhan's greatest triumph. He organized the Million Man March to Washington to express black pride under the banner of the Nation of Islam. Farrakhan's soldiers were conspicuously deployed. He still teaches them that white men are the devil created by a mad black scientist. But Farrakhan's public mask is much more rational. And the Kerner Commission... To men of all religions and beliefs, Farrakhan presents himself as the successor to Martin Luther King. And saw that America was worse today than it was in the time of Martin Luther King Jr. There's still two Americas, one black, one white, separate and unequal. Civil rights was the black demand of the 60s and 70s. Now, both Farrakhan and Orthodox Muslims believe that blacks must help themselves rather than rely on government. And I will strive, and I will strive to build business, to build business, build houses, build hospitals. Back in Detroit, some of the men who'd attended the march, worshippers from the Muslim center, gather for an evening's meditation. Ahmed Abdurrahman does not consider Farrakhan his leader, but agrees with him on the need to emphasize self-help. The growth of Islam has uh, something to do with the, the failures of the civil rights movement, and it not just failing, but having reached a peak where it can't achieve much anymore. It's a resurgence of a sense of we have, must do it for ourselves. We can't depend on white people. We can't depend on the government. We can't depend on anybody but ourselves to do for ourselves. After a while, you know, if, if people keep telling you, you're not in, you're not in, you're not in, you're not in, pretty soon you say, okay, you go your way, I'll go mine. They've gone their own way in Atlanta. It's a showpiece of their success. The W.D. Muhammad High School shows the best that Islam has achieved in America today. Its motto is, the spirit to excel. It's a model for black Muslims who wish to develop separate institutions. The graduating class, W.D. Muhammad High, 1996. Farid Alamin has won a scholarship to Harvard. Islam acts as a savior to many African Americans. It gives you a sense of belonging, and it's just something awesome about that type of community involvement that really rejuvenates the spirit. <laughs> A lot of us sitting right here will already be under the earth. The center of W.D. Muhammad's community in Atlanta is its mosque in Arabic called a masjid. Because we had habits that were taking us to the grave. And it's taken many of our friends already to the grave. Now think about a man. Think about Mainstream America has provided mostly low expectations and failure. Islam's message is to avoid that mainstream and create a self-sufficient community. 
that nothing deserves worship except Allah. And I bear witness, and I bear witness that, the Prophet Muhammad is his that Prophet Muhammad is his messenger. Each Friday, converts are received in the mosque. The message was appreciated by a Christian visitor. This is my first time visiting, so it was a nervous experience for me. And um, so I was sort of like a stranger here, but I learned a lot. I saw things that I really haven't seen in a lot of places, like a, a oneness or a unity. So I, like I said, I just feel great. It was, it was kind of scary for me though, because you know I have a Christian background, but now I'm able to like transcend even that barrier. The mosque helps Muslims to open their own businesses. Nearby, there is a chain of Islamic fast food restaurants. Integration was the ambition of the civil rights movement. Parallel development is the aim of Islam today. Muslims want African Americans to spend money in the black community rather than in white America. Black people, they get paid. They want to take their money to the Caucasian community. They want to take them because they're trying to purchase self-esteem. The stigma of slavery is so intense even now. We're still trying to soothe those wounds. They go that deep. I'm still trying to prove to you that I'm as good as you are. You don't want me to live next door to you. You don't want my child to go to school with your child. You don't want me to ride the bus with you. You don't want me to walk in your neighborhood. Blacks have rarely felt included in the melting pot of America. They've won civil rights but watch their communities decay. Even if we wanted to be part of a melting pot, it just does not exist in America. And we are going to be what, what we are and who we are for ourselves and among ourselves. And people in white America or any other part of America will have to accept us on those terms, on our terms. We've been economic slaves, we've been mental slaves. When I discovered Islam, I found out that by submitting to Allah, that I no longer cared about the standards of America. I only cared about the standards that Allah said. Black Muslims share Islam with millions of people around the world, far beyond the ghetto. It gives them a new identity, one which breaks the chains of their past.